So we're continuing our study in Genesis. I want to note that uh, chapters 37 through 50 have a particular focus on Joseph. When you think of all the main characters of the book of Genesis, you have Adam and Noah and uh, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Joseph has more press than any of them. So we should be paying particular attention to Joseph. I want you to see that that happens to be the cover of a book by Chuck Swindoll, Joseph, a Man of Integrity and Forgiveness. And if you want to follow along or move ahead, uh, I welcome you to go out to Insight for a Living or Amazon or Biblio if you want a used copy and uh, get a copy of that thing because that is the outline that we'll be following. So Joseph is sold into slavery. That's one of the big scenes that's in Joseph's life. I want to point out to you in the bottom right, you see that thing that looks like a well? He was not in a well. He was in a cistern, and we'll get to that shortly. What did Joseph take with him into Egypt. Now, one of my all-time heroes fell this past week. That was Wilma. Another one of my all-time favorites was a man named Johnny Ray Coldiron. He was a drywaller. And the first I met him, I had heard that he came up from Johnson City, Tennessee, with nothing more than a drywall hammer and a station wagon. And he did well for himself. So I'm going to ask this question. What did Joseph take with him into Egypt? You say, well, uh, just a common saying, he had his shirt on his back. Well, Joseph didn't even have his shirt on his back. But what did he take with him down into Egypt? A good attitude. Okay, so we're going to find out where the good attitude came from. Okay. He went with three gifts. What gift did he get from Jacob? Well, Jacob gave him a piece of real estate, but since, it, since his coat was taken off him, he didn't have a deed in his pocket. He said, well, there are no deeds back then. You read the book of Jeremiah, and there was a deed where he signed off when he bought a piece of real estate. But he didn't go into uh, Egypt with a deed. In fact, Joseph probably wasn't even thinking about giving that piece of real estate to him till later on. So what might have he gotten from Jacob? First of all, notice the change of the name. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons. So he had the love of his father when he went to Egypt. Now, you've heard me testify so many, many times about my wonderful earthly dad. And because of a wonderful earthly dad, it was really easy for me once God got my attention to see the love of a heavenly dad. But Joseph gave him the lesson of integrity. Well, how could that be? Um, J Jacob gave him the lesson of integrity. How can that be? Well, that word Israel is the hint. 
Jacob finally woke up. We talk about him coming to El Bethel, the God of the house of God. Jacob was explaining to Joseph, don't mess up like I did. Don't be a trickster. Don't be a deceiver. And so Jacob gave his son the lesson of integrity. Now, we covered this last week at the very tail end, asking the question, what is integrity? And it comes along with the same root that the word integer comes from. So what's an integer? Simply put, it's not a fraction. So there you have a snapshot of a ruler, okay? A measuring stick, not a king, a ruler. And there's a bigger one. And there's a little red arrow down there in the bottom. And the question becomes, how far off the mark must you go before you're no longer an integer? Right? You see the seven eighths on the one side, you see the one eighths on the other side. I used to help my dad when he was cutting things and whatnot. He didn't bother telling me one and the sixteenth. He would say one little mark off the inch. And I understood what that was. But how far off the mark must we be before we're no longer having integrity? Well, the plus or minus distance is called tolerance. And Josh McDowell wrote a book talking about the difference between conviction versus preference. I use in my own life, I have a conviction not to drink alcohol. If it were just a preference, then that might be eroded into the wrong thing for me to do. So there you have Lot. When Lot was leaving Sodom, he was saying to the angels, can I go to Zoar? It's just a little city. The city is always a picture of sin in the Bible. It's just a little sin. And what we're going to discover is if you fail God in a particular area the first time, it becomes easier to fail him in that same department the second time. So what present might he have gotten from Isaac? Hey, John, you're digging way too deep. <laughs> Isaac was the model of forgiveness. Now, last time we were together, we went through the math, and there you see where Jacob and Isaac and Joseph had six years together, and we talked about the elephant in the room, and that is the discussion of when Jacob goes and tricks his dad. Now, that happened many years prior. There's grandpa, there's father, there's son, and what did they talk about? If they missed that particular scene, then it wasn't worth talking about anything. But Isaac was the model of forgiveness for Joseph. And there you see, we're going to go all the way to chapter 50 to bring this out. Joseph said to his brothers, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good 
to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And you know, in that transaction, in those last couple chapters, you can see that the brothers never did change. Dad dies and the brothers go to Joseph and they said, you know, dad said you shouldn't be messing with us. Well, dad never said that. But there you see Joseph taking the gift from his grandfather, Isaac, and exercising it. He forgave his brothers. There was none of those things, I don't get mad, I just get even. I look at Genesis 50, verse 20, as the Old Testament version of Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So Joseph went into Israel so far with two gifts. From Jacob, he had the lesson of integrity. And from Isaac, Isaac was a model of forgiveness. What did he get from Abraham? I see, well, Abraham was dead by the time Joseph was born. How did Moses get all this information to write down? Well, you could say all scripture is given by the inspiration of God, and therefore God gave him the details. I think there was that spoken lore. The stories went from generation to generation to generation. So what did Joseph get from Abraham? He got the word of God. That phrase, the word of the Lord, appears for the first time in Scripture as it relates to Abraham. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son Isaac shall be your heir. We don't know how much of the word of God came to Abraham. But we do know the Bible says, says and Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. We studied last week about how the Lord spoke to Jacob for the very last time, and then the Lord didn't speak to anybody until the burning bush. What sustained Joseph in the land of, is, of Egypt. It was the word of God. He had the lesson of integrity, the model of forgiveness, and the word of God. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. That was Joseph as he was going into the land of Egypt. Now the Lord was with Joseph. This is still honing in on the notion of the word of God was with Joseph. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The Lord was with Joseph. There are very few people in Scripture where the Bible says the Lord was with so-and-so. And his master saw that the Lord was with him. Joseph didn't have to say to Potiphar, Hey, Pot, the Lord's with me. He saw he didn't hear he saw 
the Lord living in Joseph. And the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. The Lord shone through Joseph in the good times and in the bad. And the keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. So we're going to see that the Lord wasn't just with Joseph, but the Lord also blessed him with his presence. And the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. And from the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. Why? Because the Lord was with him. Now, here's where you get to participate. What kinds of labels, what kinds of positions, what kinds of relationships did Joseph have? Help me. I'll, I'll, I'll do the first one. He was considered a son. What other relationships did he have? He was a brother. How, what else can we give a label to Joseph? advisor okay he was a dreamer he was advisor somebody else help me i can get click right through all these things <laughs> he was a slave which meant he was also a master but not like a, a whipping kind of master he was a foreigner he went into a foreign land. He went into a different language. He was the head of a household. He was a dad. He was a prisoner. He became the prime minister. He was a provider. And he was a father. So now when you think about all those things, what kinds of emotions do you think Joseph felt over the course of time? Sorrow. Sorrow? Okay. What else? Already mentioned forgiveness. What else was what can you attribute to Joseph? responsibility okay so first of all he was loved wasn't he israel loved joseph unfortunately more than the brothers he was loved by his father hated by his brothers so there's a love-hate relationship not in one person. You say, well, I have a love-hate relationship. Well, he had a love-hate relationship coming from two different directions. Anger. Bitterness. Now, we're going to see a lot of Jesus in Joseph. But there's one thing that's in Jesus that's not in Joseph. The Bible says that Jesus was tempted as we are, yet without sin. The yet without sin part doesn't apply to Joseph. Do you think he was bitter when he was down there in that pit? 
You think he was bitter when they put the handcuffs on him? He conquered it, but he had it. He was faced with a bunch of lies that put him into agony, right? Mrs. Potiphar said, that Hebrew that you brought into the household. He was tempted, and that's going to be next week's lesson, talking about Mrs. Potiphar. He was frustrated. God, I did the right thing. I didn't mess with Mrs. Potiphar, and here I am in prison. That's not fair. He was traumatized. Now, in today's society, we talk about being victims. You know, so-and-so did this crime because he was deprived. In the West Side Story by Leonard Bernstein, there's a phrase there where the, the teenagers are talking to Officer Kupke and they say, we're depraved because we were deprived. He saw, don't know if he saw it, but he was associated in the, in the family way with the rape of his sister, the murder committed by his brothers, Simon and Levi, the incest between Reuben and his mom's handmaid, and the orphaning. Now, we talked last week about them coming down the dusty road towards Bethlehem, and there's Rachel getting ready to give birth to whose family name was Benjamin. And she's hemorrhaging and she's bleeding. And since they were traveling, there were no tents that were set up. They were traveling. So here she is on the open road, getting ready to have this baby. I can remember reading the book when I was a kid, The Good Earth by Pearl S. Buck. And they just went out into the rice paddies and had their babies. And there's mom hemorrhaging. And then mom dies. And then mom's buried. So yeah, he was traumatized, but guess what? He got over it. Now... If you happen to be on the hot seat, I don't want to say get over it because that's too mean, right? But he overcame it. So aside from all those things, he also had forgiveness, freedom from his bitterness, and less you mentioned it, a positive attitude. So now you don't have to answer this question. This is a rhetorical question, but you could show me with your hands. Who has experienced at least one of those things? More than three. Okay, then this lesson is for each of us because if our, we weren't busy doing this, we'd each of us be putting our hands in the air. Okay, we each need to grow to become smaller tolerance as we approach that inch, as we approach that integer. integer. We need to become persons of integrity. We need to become persons of forgiveness. And we be, need to become persons of God, closer to God. This lesson is for each and every one of us. Now, when I was a kid, every time we walked into the house, we said that. Christus. 
And the response was Navekia. And that's what the words meant. But they didn't really ring to me until I was saved. And a lot of times we have this academia, this these words that just fall into our brains, but they don't come down to our hearts until God drives the message home. And that's what happened to Joseph. That's what happened to Joseph. All these lessons that he got from dad, we mentioned that he had six years to sit with dad and grandfather. There's dad weaving that coat. Isaac couldn't coach him because he was blind years prior. And he's hearing these things about what Jacob did to his brother Esau, and what he did to Laban, and then what the older brothers did to Shechem and to Haman. And there's Isaac sitting there saying, yeah, he hurt me, but it was okay. And all this stuff comes together when Joseph finds himself in the bottom of that pit. So, as an overview of Joseph, what can we learn? This is what this is what this is all about. I mean, any one of us can recite, oh yeah, in chapter 37, this thing happened, and in chapter 50, Father forgot, forgot them. What can we learn? What can we apply? from Joseph. First, we need to change and we need to grow. Secondly, I want to hone in on that word zeal and I had to go to the Berean version to get the word zeal in another verse. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God but not according to knowledge. He was talking there about the Pharisees, all right? He was talking there about himself. He had a zeal for God wanting to go to Damascus and kill all the Christians, but he didn't have a knowledge of what was really happening. Even zeal is no good without knowledge. I had to go to the Berean to get that word zeal in the verse. But now you have the JTS version. That's me. Knowledge without zeal is no good either. These things have to come together. I mentioned to you already that there was more space given to Joseph than Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. I mentioned that he was a picture of Christ, but not a perfect picture of Christ because Joseph, while tempted, he also sinned. Mistreatment, loneliness, false accusations, punishment undeserved. You know, Peter writes and he says, if you're being persecuted because you deserve it, too bad for you. But if you're being persecuted because of your love for Christ, then praise the Lord for that. Paul wrote, he says, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. He was misunderstood. He had dreams that were broken. He was in impossible circumstances. And yet, integrity forgiveness, freedom from bitterness, 
and ultimately an unbelievable positive attitude. Whenever you hear the word bitterness, you think of that phrase, the root of bitterness. Spring is going to come sooner or later, and up come the dandelions. I'm a beekeeper, so I like the dandelions. But if you want to pull a dandelion, you got to get the whole root, or it's coming back. That's what bitterness is like. That's why it's called the root of bitterness. So here comes the so what. Why do we have this section of scripture? 1 Corinthians 10. Now these things happen to them. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, etc. As an example, they're written down for our instruction. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant, to you, grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Jesus Christ. Now, there's a play on words here that together you may have one voice and glorify God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is written to the plural, but it can't start in the plural. Look at those words, endurance, encouragement, harmony. They have to occur in self before they can occur in the community. Endurance, encouragement, and harmony have to work together for me so that they can work together for us. That's the so what of Joseph. We need to change and we need to grow as individuals so that we can change and grow together as a community. So, as an overview of Joseph, you can break his life down into three sections, birth to 17, 17 to 30, and 30 to death. 30 was the age when Joseph finally appears before Pharaoh. And there you see his birth verse, and there you see his death verse, 30 to his death, which was 110 years old. And the, the, the slice from 30 to death was a time of prosperity. It was the good time. But the time from 17 to 30, those were the hard times. Now, Psalm 105 gives a really good history of the nation of Israel. We're going to hone in on the section that deals with Joseph. He, the Lord, called down famine on the land and destroyed all their supplies of food. And he sent a man before them, Joseph, sold as a slave. This was all part of God's plan. They bruised his feet with shackles. His neck was put in irons. And if you simply read chapter 37, some of the details don't come out. Here are some details that come from the Psalms. We're going to see when he was down in the cistern, there's a little bit of detail that comes from later on in the narrative, but they bruised his feet with shackles. His neck was put in irons till he foretold till what he foretold came to pass, till the word of the Lord 
Remember one of those gifts? To the word of the Lord proved him true. The king sent and released him. The ruler of people set him free, and he made him master of his household, ruler over all he possessed, to instruct his princes as he pleased and teach his elders wisdom. Now, he taught them practical things like store up the food beforehand, but notice he also taught them wisdom. So, we're studying Paul on Wednesdays, and Paul had a roller coaster ride, and you can read all the different things that happen. He uh, heals a crippled man, and he ends up getting stoned, and back and forth, and back and forth. Same is true of a pastor. The pastor went through that just this week. One day he hears the death of Wilmer. Another day there's a, a, a text group that that's going where he reads where somebody gets saved. And you read the other things. And unlike Joseph and unlike Paul, where there were windows of time in between the, the peaks and the valleys. Pastor doesn't have those peaks and valleys. His is just like this. The phone call could ring one time and say, hey, we want to get married. And the phone call could ring the next time and say, my dad is dead. So what does that do to the heart of a pastor? What does it do to the heart of his wife? Joseph's story is here for our instruction. And I don't get those phone calls. You don't get those phone calls. But the pastor does. So we need to pray for our pastor. We need to pray for his wife. So there's Joseph's roller coaster. He receives the robe of many colors, only to get it stripped off him and get sold into, the, into slavery. He becomes Potiphar's steward, and the whole household is blessed. We read, we read about those verses already. Then he ends up in jail. He's in jail, but he's put in charge of the jail. And the two guys come, the butler and the baker, and he gives them the, the interpretations of their dreams. We'll get to that in a couple of weeks. And he says to the cupbearer, he says, well, just do me a huge favor. Don't forget about me. And the Bible says, two full years before the cupbearer remembers. So the roller coaster ride of Joseph. Frank Sinatra sang that song. When I was 17, it was a very good year. For Joseph, not so much, right? Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a robe of many colors. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. He was involved in a love-hate relationship, as I said. But the coat of many colors gave way to just one color. Now, Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. Now, you can ask yourself the question, why did Joseph tell the dream? 
on the one hand, you could say he was living such a great life with, with his dad that he was just plain naive. On the other hand, he was not without sin. He could be proud. Maybe it was quizzical. Maybe his brothers could help him out a little bit, but I'm going to lean on the word pride because he had some cleaning up to do. And he said to them, hear the dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. In a couple of weeks, we're going to read the scene where the brothers physically bow down to Joseph. What goes around comes around. And there you see on the left, you see Jacob pretending he was Esau. And around his neck was this freshly killed skin. We talked about a few weeks ago how it must have been gross against him. And there's his dad blind. And there's his dad being faked out in every one of his senses. We covered the five senses and how uh, Isaac tested his son and his son tricked him on every one of those senses. And then on the right, you see Jacob and the sons bringing that coat dipped in blood. Keep in mind, Isaac was there too. Isaac and Jacob mourned for Joseph together. And when you go through the math, it was more than 10 years they mourned together. What goes around comes around. And Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre, where Abraham and Isaac had sojourned. Notice that's chapter 35. We have brought Jacob and Isaac and the family together but we're in chapter 37 so he said to him go now see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock and bring me word so he sent him from the valley of hebron and he came to shechem now you see there what was jacob thinking if he was thinking anything at all jacob is you know kind of fly off the handle kind of guy what happened in Shechem? That's where Simeon and, and Levi killed all those guys. We don't know. We, when you read that verse, we don't know if Jacob knew they were in Shechem. He just knew that they were afar off and he needed some information. Maybe he knew it was Shechem. Maybe he thought the brothers could be in trouble. He sends Joseph and we're going to see they see Joseph coming from afar off and that's where they begin to uh, begin to conspire. There's a verse from 1 Samuel. This is David talking with Jonathan. You know the John Jonathan shot the arrows and he told the servant, if you have to go more, then David's in trouble. When after the servant left, David and Jonathan get together and David says, one step separates me from death. Jacob sent Joseph off to check on his brothers 
and the last he saw Jacob. When we're leaving the house in the morning, you're putting your kids on the school bus, that could be the last you ever see that member of your family. So how do you salute them as they go? Don't forget your lunch. <laughs> how about I love you? Because it could be one step separates me from death. Now the brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. We'll get to the interpretation of the, of the, the meanings of the word shortly. And Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? So he knew. Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, I, here I am. So he said to him, go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock and bring me word. Now that wasn't the first time that Joseph brought word to his dad. Look what happened a few verses earlier. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. He tattled. Now, we don't know the motivations. We don't know if it, the information was pulled out of him. But as far as the brothers were concerned, he was a rat fink. And so here comes the brother. He's a dreamer. He thinks he's better than we are. He's a tattletale. And dad loved him more. So all of the ingredients are there for this next coming tragedy. And he sent him from the Valley of Hebron that's where they started. There was Isaac, there was Jacob, and there goes Joseph. And a man found him wandering the fields, and the man asked him, what are you seeking? He said, I'm seeking my brothers. Tell me, where are they pasturing the flock? And the man said, they've gone away, for I have heard them say, let us go to Dothan. Now, we don't know if they left Shechem because there was a threat on their lives, but Dothan is going to give us a hint of why they went. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Jothan. So Joseph left fellowship. He went to where the brothers were shouldering the load of watching over the sheep. And he came to this place called two cisterns. Now, a cistern is a place where you store water. You go over to Israel, and there are some beautiful cisterns where the sides, and the, they're all made out of mosaic. They're just gorgeous. But there were two cisterns there. One was empty. Doesn't mention the other one. And we know that the climate in Israel had dry spells, and the brothers, I guess they went up to Dothan because they were in the middle of the dry season. One of the cisterns was empty, and the other one was full. So, over the course of a very little piece of time, Joseph goes from fellowship to trouble to oppression, down into Egypt. So, Jacob's plan was to show, send his son 50 miles. God's plan, and we just read Psalm 105, was to send him over 300 miles. 
He went from Hebron to Shechem to Dothan to Egypt. Now, that is a picture of Dothan, that plateau, that's Dothan. And we read, they saw him from afar off. So if they're up on this plateau and they see little brother coming with the multicolored coat on, it wasn't like he was wearing camo. They see him from afar off, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, here comes the dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of these pits, one of these cisterns, and then we will say, that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what become what be, what will become of his dreams. Just like their dad, a trickster, a deceiver, and the the mind just just cranks that right out before Joseph even shows up. But when Reuben heard it. He rescued him out of their hands, saying, let us not take his life. Now, let's keep in mind, Reuben was unstable. We're going to see that when, Jen, when uh, Jacob prophesies about each of the tribes. He calls him unstable. But here's this guy. He's finally coming around. says, let's not take his life. And Reuben said to him, shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him. Here's his motivation, that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. So Reuben is clean on this one. So when Joseph came to his brothers, that was the very first thing they did. Get rid of that coat. And they took him and threw him into a pit. And the pit was empty. There was no water in it. And then they sat down to eat. Now, that picture on the left is what the bottom of a cistern looks like looking up. What? did Joseph get to look at? Who did Joseph call on to answer? Well, we know we called on his brothers. We read that from uh, five chapters ahead. Then they said to one another, in truth, we are guilty concerning our brother. Here's the, here, here are the brothers They're in the presence of Joseph. Joseph been faking out that he, he acted like he didn't know the Hebrew language. He used as a, 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 an interpreter. And so he's hearing the brothers sharing what Joseph is hearing for the first time. So Joseph is calling on his brothers, but he's not getting the answer he was hoping for. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. There they are. They're having their lunch. There's brother down there yelling and screaming for his life. And here comes the caravan. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? So we're skipping over Simon and Levi. Who were the ones that killed all those people at Shechem? Simon and Levi. And I said earlier on, if you commit a particular, if you commit a particular sin the first time, the second time is a lot easier. Think of that first 
Then comes the second one. These are written for our instruction. <laughs> it's, you know, it seems larger than life, right? But Cain killed his brother. And so what sins are we capable of doing? All of them. Jesus said, if you're angry with your brother, you're already guilty of murder. Well, let me tell you something. I had a brother, and I spent more time, I think, angry with him than I did. Of course, we're fixing that up now. We spent about an hour on the phone the other day. Uh, but it wasn't that way when we were younger. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Reuben tried to rescue him. He was clean. Simeon and Levi, were they still thinking about killing him off? We don't know. Judah says, hey, I've got this great idea. And then the, the, all the brothers say, hey, that's a wonderful idea. Let's get some cash out of this guy. And when Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes and returned to his brothers and said, the boy is gone and I, where shall I go? So when Reuben was clean on the one hand, but he wasn't worried about Joseph. He was worried about image. What am I going to tell Pop? We're running a little bit over, but we want to get to the punchlines here, okay? And you're going to have to read quickly. Lessons learned. First, no family is exempt from adversity. I mentioned John Coldiron's family, and they had all kinds of grief in their family. Yesterday, we celebrated Wilmer's family. And if you know anything about Wilmer's family, they were not exempt from adversity either. No enemy is more subtle than passivity. Here's a lesson from Jacob if you go back over his life. He was too busy and too self-centered. There was Reuben still self-centered for his family. He was preoccupied and unconcerned. He was too passive to deal with the family issues. No response is more cruel than jealousy, and no condition is more unfair than slavery.